So, uh, Dr. Baggett, your main focus is in the, the moral argument and moral apologetics. What sort of draws you to that subfield of uh, philosophy and, and engagement? Yeah, well, you know, if I, if I look back at my life and I ask myself the question, what really got me interested in these issues? I, I think there were maybe, maybe three childhood experiences that were quite formative. One, I grew up watching Mr. Rogers, mm. uh, who <laughs> just embodied moral apologetics as far as I'm concerned. Uh, two, I grew up in the holiness tradition, and you know, very much the camp meeting tradition, which is like church on steroids, you know, one, one, one week or, or two every summer. And, uh, and in the holiness tradition in particular, there's a lot of emphasis on sanctification, right, and being changed, becoming the people that God wants us to be. And that made me think about ethic, ethics. And then uh, a, a third uh, childhood experience, I remember seeing a, a commercial uh, when I was five or six years old, I a little child being handed some food by a relief worker. And I just remember having this profound sense of how bright and beautiful and good that was and how nothing would ever change my mind. I mean, I, I couldn't be more certain of anything than that. All of those experiences I, I remember as being very formative and sort of shaping me. Uh, but all growing up, I wanted to study science. But then when I hit college and took a philosophy class just because I had to, I absolutely uh, fell in love with it and was so engaged that I finally threw caution to the wind, majored in philosophy, not knowing what I'd do with it. Uh, while I was in college, I think that was when I first encountered the so-called Euthyphro dilemma from an early Socratic dialogue that raises questions about if there is a, this connection between God and ethics, how that works. And so then after that, I went to seminary. And that's when I really began to delve into these issues you know, in greater uh, depth. And by the end of seminary, I wanted to get a PhD. And I knew from day one that I wanted to write on the Euthyphro Dilemma, which I did in my dissertation. And then by the time I finished the dissertation, I realized that I could then extend that work into like a moral argument. Mm -hmm. I, I thought, boy, that, that seems to have a lot of potential, especially if you can critique secular ethics, defend theistic ethics against various objections, including Euthyphro-inspired objections, and predicate the whole thing on some kind of moral realist view. And I was, I was deeply, I, I've always been deeply committed to something like moral realism, I think ever since I saw that commercial as a boy. Mm. And, uh, and so as, as a Christian, it made a lot of sense to me that something as important as morality would evidentially point toward, toward God. And so I began to work in that area. And over time, that's really become my main area of specialization. And I've realized that, boy, it's enough work for a lifetime. I mean, it's, it's enough work for a community for several lifetimes. <laughs> There's just so much work to be done. And it's work that I just adore. You know, there's, there's just something about every aspect of this discussion that I find utterly mesmerizing and engaging. Yeah, and so, yeah, it doesn't even seem like work, of course, you know, when right. you're just doing something that you, that you love. And uh, so, that, so that's really what has drawn me to this. And then uh, as time has passed, too, I've seen other people say similar things. You know, Al Planiga, when asked which argument from natural theology he thinks is the most effective, he thinks it's the moral argument. And William Lane Craig, when asked when he goes to college campuses, which argument has the most impact, he says the moral argument. Even though the cosmological argument's his personal favorite, he admits mm -hmm. it's the moral argument that seems to have the most influence. And so, yeah, these additional confirmations have just uh, driven home to me the point that this is a worthwhile study, and, and not just for you know, a person or two, but really for a community, which is what, what we're trying to build at, at Houston Christian with the, uh, with the center that I direct, mm -hmm. the Center for the Foundations of Ethics. I really envision, I dream about a, a community of scholars collaborating and working together on these, on these important matters. Yeah, and, and, and more so with the, the moral argument, uh, it, it seems to me that the character of the defender of that argument is extremely important. You know, if, it, it's one thing if you defend the cosmological argument and you're a jerk, but if you try to say, you know, morality is this really important thing and it's grounded in God and I'm a Christian and then you're a jerk, that's, that's particularly a, a problem. So uh, how, how do you see the, the, the role of character uh, being perhaps even shaped by the argument or you know, influencing its, its uh, persuasiveness? 
Yeah, it makes the, it makes the guy who works on the moral argument all the time feel perpetually guilty. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, there is a profound sense in which you feel uh, unworthy of the task almost all the time mm -hmm. because you're talking about, you know, these matters of, of moral transformation and the goodness of God and, and uh, such. And, uh, and, and, you know, as, as Christians, uh, all of us, if we're honest, realize the myriad ways in which we fall short all, all the time. Mm -hmm. But of course, what also helps here is the, the centrality of God's love and his grace, you know, and the fact that his, his grace is greater than all of our sin and that he loves us despite our failures. And when he called us, you know, to work uh, for him, uh, he knew very well all of the ways in which we would fall short in, in, the, in the future. So it's, it's no surprise to him. Um, and so it's, it's heartening just to remember that God's grace is uh, sufficient uh, for us. But yeah, I take your point. Uh, I think the, the way in which you uh, promulgate the moral argument becomes especially important in light of the, the nature of the argument. Yeah, so you, know, you don't want to cheat on an ethics exam <laughs> and you don't want to <laughs> be a moral apologist who is um, failing to respect people, accord them the honor and respect they deserve and and so forth. And in heated discussions and dialogues and, and debates, you know, that's a temptation. And of course, we have to be really vigilantly on guard against that. And on occasion, we might cross a line and not do it perfectly, right? Because mm -hmm. we're not yet perfected. You know, we're on a journey. And when we mess up, you know, we just have to come back before God's uh, throne of grace and ask for mercy and forgiveness and another chance. And, uh, and he gladly gives it to us. So yeah, you know, the role we play is, a, is an important one, but it's also a relatively ancillary one, of course, mm -hmm. right? The real work that's getting done is God's work, and we're privileged to play our part in that. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to underestimate or overestimate, right, uh, the, the work we're distinctively called to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, that, that fits in a lot with some of the, the phenomenon that you, you talk about in, in the argument. Um, the, uh, in your book, God and Cosmos, I believe the, the core of it is you talk about uh, moral value, uh, moral obligations, knowledge, and transformation. Um, and last night at, the, at, at our talk, you uh, talked a lot about moral value. You know, do we need God to be good? And is there intrinsic human dignity without that? When you're highlighting there, particularly in a Christian life, more so things like moral transformation is you know a significant is a significant issue. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on on those uh, other two phenomena uh, with uh, what, what you mean by moral knowledge and, and particularly this moral transformation idea. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we give this fourfold case, right? And uh, so the, first we're talking about various moral facts like uh, duties and values and, and whatnot. And sometimes I narrow the focus specifically to something like human value. And that's what we mm -hmm. talked about last night, which I, th which I think just has a lot of potential to reach people. It's a great kind of bridge building exercise to, mm -hmm. to, to, to do. And you could also talk about other additional moral facts, by the way, you know, like moral rights or uh, moral freedom, moral mm -hmm. regrets, uh, and, and the like. Maybe even moral evil at, at some point, right? And maybe we'll talk about that later a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then moral knowledge, that's sort of the second one, and, and I'll talk about that in a second here. And then two aspects of what are called Kantian moral faith. One is this performative matter of our being forgiven and changed, transformed, ultimately even perfected. Uh, according to Christian theology at any rate. Mm -hmm. And then the other one has to do with the sort of correspondence between virtue and happiness. Uh, and this is a, the matter of moral rationality, and that's sort of the fourth of the fourfold case. So the ones that you want me to talk about are moral knowledge and moral transformation. Right. So moral knowledge, you know, is different from, say, moral facts, right? So uh, think about uh, an analogy, right? W uh, whether they're extraterrestrials, that's a, that's a fact. It is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's a factual question. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this is perhaps what I should have said. Um, and, and so, you know, then, but whether we know it to be the case or not, right. that's another matter. So suppose there are extraterrestrials. It doesn't mean we know that there are, right? Mm. So knowledge and, the, and what the facts are, you know, there's potentially a disconnect there. So even supposing moral realism is true and that there are objective, say, moral facts, mm -hmm. uh, how do we account for our knowledge of them? 
Well, we come to possess knowledge, presumably, by our epistemic faculties, right? By the way in which our minds work and, and kind of grab hold of these aspects of the world and of reality. Uh, a big challenge uh, that, uh, that a lot of ink has been spilled on in recent years and, and decades uh, res with respect to moral knowledge has to do with, well, let's suppose something like evolution is true, and especially mm. uh, evolution on a naturalistic story, so naturalistic evolution. So you have this unguided process of evolution by which we've come about, right? This is the way most of our naturalistic friends think of these things. Uh, how is it that we would have uh, just fortuitous, fortuitously have, have developed the requisite epistemic faculties by which to grasp these moral truths and facts that are just somehow mm -hmm. out there, right? This is a this is a rather difficult question to answer, especially uh, when we think of evolution as an unguided process, uh, where its goal is not necessarily to believe in the truth, but to encourage behaviors that conduce to reproductive advantage and, and mm -hmm. things like that. So evolution doesn't necessarily select for truth, right? But for traits that conduce to our survival. And, uh, and so, so what principled reason is there to think that our minds would have developed in such a way that they would have targeted these moral truths and that mm -hmm. the beliefs that we form about morality would actually correspond with these objective truths that uh, are out there. We're presuming that they exist for a moment. Of right. course, if they don't exist, then that's a mm -hmm. problem. There, and, then, and then we'd have no moral knowledge for sure. Uh, but even if they're, they are there, more needs to be told about how it is that our minds would have developed in such a way as to target them. And, uh, you know, on, on, on lots of stories, it's, it's infinitesimally unlikely on that kind of naturalistic evolutionary story that it would have worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been like, you know, shooting a bullet across the universe and hitting a, a, a one square inch target or something. Mm -hmm. It would have yeah. just been very unlikely to be pushed and pulled around by the forces of evolution. And it just so happens that our beliefs exactly correspond with these objective truths that are out there. What story can you tell as a naturalist evolutionist, mm -hmm. uh, according to which that's a plausible scenario? What's interesting about these so-called uh, evolutionary debunking objections is that for the most part, they have been pushed and promoted not by theists, mm. but by naturalists who themselves recognize these challenges. And in fact, for this reason, uh, the most significant voices in this arena have actually moved away from moral realism and have thought it's just an unlikely scenario that there are these truths that we can apprehend. Uh, and, and come to possess knowledge of. And so they've tended to move in other directions, you know, constructivism, expressivism, error mm -hmm. theory, or something like that. Yeah, um, so you mentioned something about, uh, I believe it, it was Kant uh, that you were referencing that said that there should be some type of confluence between the things that we consider moral and the things that we consider um, flourishing, I think, for human life mm. or something to that effect. I'm wondering if a naturalist might be able to appropriate that and say, that morality, what we consider moral and what contributes to our survival in some sense has to co correspond yeah. in the same way that Kant's kind of making that yeah. inference. Yeah, so the evolutionary ethicists often will push this sort of line according to which, well, on our view, ethics conduces to survival and survival is good. And so that which you know conduces to our survival is good. And, and most of us would uh, tend to agree with, with that right off the bat, right? In general, at least non-morally good, right? Mm. But what about morally good? I mean, suppose in a particular situation, a fellow um, you know, uh, decides that the only way in which he's going to engage in a behavior that conduces to reproductive advantage is by raping a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose he's in a situation where this is the only way in which his genes are gonna make it. Um, well, on that kind of evolutionary story, then that would become th that which would enable him to survive and, and mm -hmm. flourish and, and find reproductive success and, and so forth. I think evolution is a notoriously uh, unreliable mechanism mm -hmm. for generating what we consider to be uh, moral truths that kind of align and correspond with our deepest intuitions on these various matters. Uh, yeah, survival uh, is, is, is a pretty good thing. Uh, but sometimes morality requires potentially self-sacrifice. 
mm-hmm. or, so, or something like that. And it's not at all clear how evolution per se could account for something like an obligation to mm-hmm. behave in any particular way. Mm-hmm. Right? Where would this binding, authoritative, moral obligation come from by the resources of evolution alone? That's, that's altogether unclear. And I think, by the way, this is, uh, this is uh, an important subtext in this whole discussion to bear in mind, that what we're talking about when it comes to morality is not just a set of behaviors, say, that happen to conduce to our happiness or reproductive advantage or survival, right? Those are, those are, uh, those are matters of some import, right? But morality, if we're honest about what morality is and when we're really attentive to the evidence that morality provides, it pushes us to, to think about a number of other things, right? I think, I think too often, if you envision morality like a big cathedral, and you, when you first go into it, there's just like, a, say, a little anteroom chamber or something like that. I think, I think that's where you're talking about things like survival or mm-hmm. reproductive advantage, um, right? They're not, they're not altogether insignificant when it comes to morality, but, I mean, they're just like the first minimal step into this grand cathedral. Mm-hmm. But when you get to the upper spires of this cathedral and, and so forth, and, and you start talking about gift and sacrifice or self-sacrificing behaviors, love, you know, uh, deep charity for others, loving your neighbors, yourself. Mm -hmm. All that stuff that they talked about early on, that doesn't even touch it. That doesn't even touch it. And and I'm afraid that what happens too often in these discussions of evolutionary ethics is that there is a, uh, there's a a willingness to settle Mm -hmm. for a very minimalist understanding or construal of what morality is is all about. And Mm -hmm. just much too much is left out. Yeah, just, just a sort of instinctual altruism, and that seems to be sufficient to, to explain all the, yeah. all the rest. And, and, and just to finish that other, yeah. in contrast to a naturalistic perspective, a theistic perspective does potentially account, and account very well, for the correspondence between our moral beliefs and, and uh, objective moral facts. Because presumably, God, loving us, having created mm-hmm. us for reasons and purposes and in His image, wants us to have that kind of knowledge. He wants mm-hmm. it to be able to shape us and direct our steps and, and so forth. And uh, he would presumably, you know, in his loving providence, construct our epistemic faculties in such a way that they would reliably put us in touch mm-hmm. with those truths. And so it's just a fundamentally different account. And I think one that's much more plausible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, for me, it, it seems to me that th- this question of moral knowledge, I, I think is one of the, the weakest parts um, or, or the most difficult phenomenon for, to account for in some of the more, um, I guess, robust secular accounts. Like I, I'm thinking of the sort of uh, neo-pagan, not pagan, sorry, neo-Platonist types, uh, like Eric Wielenberg, for example, mm-hmm. that, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand his view, he says that there are these um, objective existing moral entities, like they really exist, but they exist sort of in this Platonic realm. But it seems to me that the bridge between terrestrial beings that are evolving and scraping out an existence on a planet and these high, literally, in a sense, otherworldly entities, the, yeah. the epistemic gap there seems yeah. um, imparable, which um, as, as much as uh, you know, that sort of platonic view may account for, for, for other things, it seems to me that the bridging that knowledge almost seems like you need to have a causally active platonic object, which is basically God at that point, I, I would understand. Yeah, right. I, uh, it, it, I, I, I'm curious if, if you kind of share that assessment or if, or if I'm kind of off base and thinking No, I think that, you're yeah. exactly right. Um, you know, and Craig has said as much, uh, with respect to Wielenberg, he's called his metaphysics voodoo <laughs> metaphysics, right. because how, how, how would our minds connect up with these uh, abstract truths, uh, assuming mm-hmm. that they, they do exist? So it's an account of the moral realist component. But, but then you've got the moral knowledge challenge. And, and, I, and I think at that point, if you, ha, if you have agreed on error theory and expressivism, constructivism, and all that, and moral realism, and, and uh, even non-naturalism, and you're forced then between uh, theism and Platonism, I think theism wins hands down. Mm-hmm. So Platonism could explain some things, but I think theism could explain all those things and more. Mm-hmm. And thus, it's the better account. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the phenomenon of uh, moral transformation as well, to uh, kind of discuss that uh, uh, for, for a bit, um, if I understand correctly, is, is the general idea that we sometimes observe 
uh, people that were morally inferior and they become morally better, and this phenomenon is incoherent unless there's some degree of objective morality. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, l let me lay, lay it out this way. So um, who got me thinking about this was John Hare, who teaches mm -hmm. at, at, at Yale. Actually, he just retired. Um, so, so yeah, in fact, when we wrote uh, the book Good God, we really didn't get much into the issue um, of moral transformation. And one of his critiques, because he wrote a Notre Dame philosophical review of it, was that you know we didn't get so much into this performative question of how do we live up to the moral law, and this was a big Kantian concern. Well, at that point, at that stage in my work, I just hadn't I hadn't kind of gotten there yet. But by the time we did God and Cosmos, I realized, oh, this is a, a really important aspect of the discussion, and I want to be able to talk about this because it's so interesting and intriguing and just rife with potential. So. Uh, the uh, uh, hair, the way he does it, he, he wrote a book called The Moral Gap. And it's the gap that exists between the best that we can do and what morality requires, mm. right? And, and again, he's very reliant on some ideas that are drawn from Immanuel Kant, who recognized these issues clearly. And who was, by the way, really the first full-fledged moral apologist, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in the history of, the, of Western philosophy and such. Well, what do you do with this gap? You could sort of exaggerate what we're capable of, right? But that's not really honest, right? But some people try to do that. But it, 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 it at most sort of leads to rather marginal improvements. But it can't kind of meet this unyielding standard of what morality requires. And uh, Or you could sort of say, well, morality, you know, let's just sort of domesticate it a little bit and bring that standard down, right? So you sort of compromise morality in that way. And Kant would have nothing to do with that, and Hare likewise says just that's just not the way way to go. Or you could appeal to some sort of substitute for, say, divine grace to close the gap, uh, a substitute that's more secular in, in nature of one sort or another. And in Hare's book, he, he takes you through several examples, and he says they just don't really work. But what would work is this idea of divine assistance. Mm -hmm. If God comes along and enables us to do what he has called us to do, Right. Mm -hmm. And that makes good sense, right, if ought implies can or something mm -hmm. like that. And we have this intuitive sense that morality requires us, us to meet a certain standard, right? How is it that we ought to do something that we simply can't do, right? It would make mm -hmm. little sense if I were to say you ought to jump to the moon if you simply, mm -hmm. it's impossible for you, right? Yeah. And, and yeah, so there, it's, there's something analogous here, right? You jump to the moral moon, even though you can't, you ought to. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our, our language just ceases to have meaning. So, uh, so yeah, uh, this, this is a very important question of how is it, if there is this moral demand upon us to behave in a particular way, that we can meet that standard. And uh, Christianity, in particular, I think offers impeccable resources to believe that God's grace comes along and really enables us first to find the forgiveness that we need for having invariably fallen short. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to change us and transform us. That's that issue of sanctification that I mentioned earlier, so central to my own upbringing, and so central, of course, just to biblical teaching about salvation, soteriology. And then ultimately, we don't just want to be transformed to some degree, right? We want to be utterly transformed, mm -hmm. right? We, we sort of sense within us this call to something like moral perfection. But of course, we fall short of it all the time in, in this life. But we we dream of it. We, we sense, oh, what would, it, what would it be like to be completely delivered from moral weakness and deficiency, you know, and to become truly the people we were meant to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but that notion of something like perfection is utterly uh, beyond the reach of anything like naturalistic resources could provide. But in Christian theology, this is the very doctrine of glorification. Mm -hmm. And this is a real and living hope for us and a hope that won't disappoint. We can have every expectation and every confidence that uh, there is in God's grace uh, forgiveness, change, and ultimately even complete transformation into complete conformity to the image of, of Christ. And so these three deep existential moral needs mm -hmm. can be met uh, by Christianity. And that's what makes this variant of the moral argument so powerful, not just to argue for bare or generic theism, Mm -hmm. but something more like distinctively Christian theism. Mm -hmm. And that's an exciting prospect. And, um, which sort of, I guess, uh, secular alternative to this divine grace or divine soteriology, or uh, what secular soteriology, if you will, do you think um, 
well, first, what are on offer, and, and which ones do you think are at least get some of the way there? Yeah. Well, you might hear the uh, certain secularists say, well, what we need to do is work really hard, be very intentional and vigilant in uh, cultivating empathy for other people. And they're not wrong, of course. Uh, but their idea is, well, look, if you develop enough imaginative empathy, you can really put yourself into the shoes of other people to such a degree that you can overcome that, that moral gap. And I, and I think, again, they're, they're not wrong. This is the thing about secular ethics. They're often, they're often at least half right. Mm -hmm. There's something that they're saying here that is, is powerful. Uh, we should, as, as people, cultivate empathy. Um, and in so doing, we're going to be more effective at, say, discharging the golden rule, mm -hmm. right? Treating others as we'd like to be treated ourselves and, and, and so forth. And, uh, and so uh, imaginative exercises like reading great novels and stories and things like that can, I think, enlarge our em em empathetic capacities. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. But if they're putting all their eggs in that one basket, and this is often what happens, like there's just too much of that that goes on, like, well, this is the solution, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think they're going to be disappointed because as human beings, we are, though infinitely valuable, frankly, not particularly good. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look honestly at what we, I mean, think about the martyrs in the early church being, you know, sawn in two. Who does that? Mm -hmm. Human beings do that. Right? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, who, who nails people to a cross? Well, we do. I mean, it's, it's weird, right? I mean, it's just crazy the horrific things that we have done. I mean, think about the Holocaust. And right. um, yeah, and, and you know, some, somebody, the guy used to teach at Biola, I forget his name, um, Clay something or other. <laughs> he, anyway, he, he's uh, done a lot of work on this where he, he went back and throughout history and looked at a lot of the atrocities that were done. And uh, it really looked into who were these people doing it or who were, were these German soldiers during mm -hmm. the Holocaust. You know who they were? They were just average, ordinary, normal human beings who, in particular circumstances, could behave in the most wretched of ways. Mm -hmm. Which is to say that you and I are capable of the same thing. Mm -hmm. We have a moral sickness within us. We are profoundly susceptible to moral failure of the worst sorts. So we can try to cultivate empathy and all of that, and we should. Mm -hmm. But if we think that that's our salvation, if that's what's going to provide us the full measure of deliverance from these really antisocial tendencies we have within us and these proclivities toward injustice and cruelty and meanness and treachery, we're just going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Now, I think some might push back on that and, and highlight that there are some atrocities that may only be enabled by, say, religious belief. And they may point out that there are some uh, uh, Christian groups or, or even, you know, uh, I won't mention any others, but there, there, there are some that would look at, say, some of the commands of Scripture and say, there are some things that don't fit with, with our secular ethics here, and the only reason that you would believe that is because, you know, Scripture uh, tells you to. Um, I, can think, for example, like sexual ethics is a big one, um, you know, that Christians typically are more reserved in that field and say there are things you just cannot do in, in, this, in this realm, more or less because God kind of says so um, in, in, in that respect. What would be kind of your response to someone who is coming at it sort of with the flip view that says, you know, uh, you talk about positive moral transformation. Well, what I see is that, you know, you're held back by a primitive book and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and you know, these, these rules that we should have left a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with respect to that first point that, you know, uh, it, usually it's religious conviction that drives the worst of the treacheries, you know. Yeah, Pascal said something like that at one point, like evil is never done so zealously as when it's done out of religious conviction. Yeah. <laughs> and of course that's true. Religion can, can uh, it, twisted religion can inspire all manner of, of evil uh, actions. But really any, any deeply felt ideology can, even secular ones. And we've, mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of that in the 20th century. Um, but, but with respect to, yeah, ethics, nowadays, if you, as, as, as soon as you bring up uh, ethics with most anybody, the, the, the discussion is going to gravitate toward the sexual ethics stuff, mm -hmm. and especially biblical proscriptions against, say, something like homosexuality or whatnot. And, uh, 
that's just a violation of where we're at, you know, like culturally, it kind of goes against the grain of the culture. Um, incidentally, it rather went against the grain of the culture even originally when these teachings were promulgated. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a book, good book I, I, I read recently, or I'm still reading it, but I'm nearly done, by, I got by a guy named Truman who teaches at Grove City, and it's about the origins of the modern self. It's such a good book. And uh, I would really encourage anyone who wants to think about this issue to read that book, because what it does is it, it, it says, okay, in order to understand our current moment, right, these kinds of things that people are mm -hmm. saying, instead of just trying to respond uh, off the cuff to what they're saying right here and now, let's kind of go back and think about, right, all of the various cultural influences, both philosophical and just larger cultural influences that shaped this moment, that went into this moment. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a fascinating tale. Um, yeah, so to go from, say, a conception of morality according to which morality best suits us to fit into a larger community, to be concerned for other people, to be more altruistic, things like that, that's really sort of been flipped on its head. And we've moved from there to an understanding of morality nowadays. The prevailing view is morality is about self-fulfillment, mm -hmm. right? And it's about my feelings. and things like that, right? So if it makes me happy, who are you to say anything different? And if your old book says anything uh, contrary to that, well, then your old book is just wrong, right? Mm. But it's, it's really quite a shift that's taken place because we've moved from a, a deeply altruistic kind of understanding of m morality to one that is profoundly self-focused uh, and where, the own, where one's own sovereign will has been sort of enthroned as all, as all authoritative. Like, mm -hmm. it's what I want to do. Uh, no matter what, and if uh, I want to understand myself, you know, to be a woman, I can choose to do that. And who are you to say anything different? You know, if I mm -hmm. want to pursue this lifestyle or that, if it makes me happy, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, as a Christian, obviously, I mean, uh, we just see things rather, rather differently. Um, we do believe that if God tells us to do something, that uh, we should do it, or if he tells us not to do something, we, should, we shouldn't do it. But we believe it for principled reasons. Uh, and as a moral apologist, I mean, I can give you quite a number of reasons why I think that God is good and, and loving, and God has our best interest at heart, and because of his omniscience, he knows all things, uh, he can clue us in as to what really is best for us. And the idea is that there are certain behaviors that simply will not ultimately conduce to our deepest joy. And, uh, and, and this is a good reason to o obey his commands mm -hmm. and to res respect his authority because he really has that kind of authority, both because of the content of what he's saying and because of who he is. Mm -hmm. He is our creator. He created us with our telos, he, mm -hmm. a, a goal in mind, and so forth. By the way, that's been another important shift. We've sort of lost that conception of a human telos. Mm -hmm. So now it's just about whatever I choose to be. There's no preordained telos anymore. Now it's just all a matter of whatever I happen to mm -hmm. choose. I think that rather makes shipwreck of, of morality, to be honest with you. It doesn't explain morality, it explains it away. And I think that we're only beginning to see the whirlwind of, of uh, horrendous results from going that, down that particular uh, path. No, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we need to rediscover the true uh, robust foundations of morality if we're going to understand it to be the, the mechanism by which it was, it was designed to help us become who we were meant to be. Mm -hmm. so you, you were mentioning there that in, um, you know, particularly as Christians who believe in revealed theology, Whenever we say that God has revealed a command or God has revealed His will on something, that's that's fairly you know binding on things uh, and binding on our actions. Um, so um, some people would look at some of those commands and, and and requirements and just say, well, like you like you were saying, I don't really agree with this. I think that the problem is with the God. It's not it's not with me. It's and it, it's with this book or it's with this God. Um, and I uh, don't want to put you on the hook for, for something your co-author said, but that line of reasoning is very similar to something in Good God where um, there was an argument that essentially rejects a sort of Calvinist understanding of God on the basis of, well, this understanding of God leads to certain commands that don't make sense, and so the problem is with this conception of God, 
it's actually not with uh, you know whatever is 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 revealed in, in mm -hmm. scripture or something to to that effect. I know that is Dr. Walls's main uh, focus. I don't know uh, if you if you share in that, but it seems to me that there may be a type of uh, I suppose parity between those those lines of thinking. Um, so first, is is that, is that true that there's parity, and secondly. When do we allow our reason to sort of guide our theology versus our theology to guide our actions, if that, yeah. if that makes sense? Well, I don't think you can get away from reason. Um, you know, it, 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 it's sort of non-negotiable. It's the uh, mechanism by which we can even start to do theology in the first place, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, and so if you come across something like uh, logical... I, I suppose I should say natural reason in that case. So, yeah, our, our sort of... Well, I don't want to be circular about our preconceived notions before we, before we come to Scripture in that. Yeah, yeah. I got you. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, so if we come across something like a patent contradiction or something like that, then obviously we have good rational reason to reject it, right? We, now, what about our deeply held moral intuitions? Well, uh, some of them are fairly non-negotiable. Right, mm -hmm. and they ought to be. It seems to me because I think that they're a function of general revelation. I think they're convictions that we have and ought to have as human beings of the deepest ingression. We should hold them very deeply, and they they're, they should be non-negotiable. Right, like it's wrong to torture children for fun. <laughs> okay. Right. So, in principle, if God were to tell us to torture a child for fun, I think that would give us good reason to think that God's not good. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's the conclusion that God Himself wants us to to draw in that counterfactual, right? So, but, but what about, what about um, Calvinistic theology, say? Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm in full agreement with Jerry on these issues. Okay. Um, just, yeah. I, so, I've read a lot of his work and he seems to work in a Calvinist <laughs> dig in just about everything, <laughs> even if it's not directly relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, in, in Good God, the reason why there, there was a chapter devoted to it was because we want to talk about God's necessary goodness, mm -hmm. um, you know, God's essential goodness, our knowledge of God's goodness, and this issue of God's, you know, uh, our ability to, to recognize that God is good, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and that's important, right? It's kind of like that distinction earlier between the, the fact of the matter and our knowledge of it, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, uh, so regarding... Regarding Calvinism, and I don't, I don't, I don't, even though I'm in full agreement with Jerry on all of this, um, I don't tend to pick fights with Cal Calvinists anymore. But, but mm -hmm. only because you're asking, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. talk about it. Uh, because you know we agree on more than we disagree, and and, and all of that. Although I was heartened uh, yesterday to see uh, Bobby Conway uh, do a video uh, talking about how he uh, moved away from Calvinism after mm -hmm. reading Good God. I, I, I was very gratified by that. Um, and, and other people have written and, and have said similar things. And of course, other people have uh, gotten really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Good God was strategically named that because we really wanted to emphasize that God is good. God mm -hmm. is truly good. God's essential nature is good and loving. This, is, this has much to do with the, that perichoretic relationship of the persons of the Trinity mm -hmm. that have existed in this harmonious, loving relationship, uh, you know, forever. Um, this is who God is. So when God is loving and kind, it's not just what he's doing. It's, it's really coming out of who he is, mm -hmm. right? So we really wanted to emphasize that God is love, essentially love. Now, when it comes to something like perdition, hell, and such, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> sometimes people will say, well, God is loving, but, that word but is so important for them, but... He's also a God of justice and this and that and the other, you know, and you reject Christ, you're going to go to hell. And, uh, but, 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 you know, God is loving, but he's all these other things. I say God is loving and he's all these other things. These other things are not in the least tension with his love. God is essentially loving and that colors everything, including his, his providence, his sovereignty, um, you know, everything else. Uh, it, Everything that it, his holiness, it's it's all loving sovereignty, loving holiness, and, and so forth, right? In this sense, I, I differ a little bit from from the Calvinists who tend to say God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he happens to be loving as well. But it's sovereign loving, like you know, I love you, but I don't love you, or something like that. 
Now, some say God loves everybody, but some of them just flat out say God doesn't love everybody. Uh, and of course, if you're a five point Calvinist, then you believe that Jesus didn't die for everybody. Um, and the Bible says that we know that uh, God loves us because Jesus died for us while we were sinners. So if Jesus didn't die for you, what good biblical argument do you have that God loves you? I actually think the consistent Calvinist position would be that God doesn't love you if Jesus didn't die for you. Um, I don't know how they get around that one. So it seems to me that God loves everyone. And again, it's not just what he does, it's who he is. So that means Jesus died for everybody. Now, if Jesus were to die for you and here are the resources to be saved, and then I offer it to you, but first I tie your hands behind your back so that you can't accept the offer. Is it fair for me then to say, I offered it to you, you didn't take it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can't take it, how can we say you ought to have taken it, right? Ought implies can. So yeah, I mean, I, I just find that Calvinistic theology threatens what I consider to be the most central doctrine of all for us as Christians, the very love of God. In what recognizable sense does God love the non-elect on their view? They're not gonna be conferred the effectual grace by which they can repent and be saved. Jesus didn't die for them before they were ever born not based on God's foreknowledge of what they would choose to do or not to, to do. By God's sovereign choice alone, they were destined for damnation from before they were ever born. Mm -hmm. To me, this isn't a matter of the conquest narratives like, why would God have you know, t told the Jews to slay the Amalekites or something, right? That's challenging, that's hard. Uh, it's not impossible. This other one strikes me as flat, rationally impossible. And that's why I would draw a distinction between the two. And, and notice that the chapter that, that we wrote on this was called A Reformed Tradition Not Quite Right. We think it's close to being right, but that little bit of difference makes all the difference. So I believe uh, with Calvinists that we need God's grace to be saved, but I believe that, God, that, that that grace is offered to everyone. And they think that it can't be resisted once it's offered, and I think that it can. I think someone can resist to the bitter end every last overture of God's love. And that's what makes hell tragic. Mm -hmm. I might ask my Calvinist friends, on your view, what makes hell tragic? On their view, God could have saved everyone without violating anyone's free will because they subscribe to a compatibilist view of freedom, according to which mm -hmm. God could have freely determined us to accept Christ. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise, but on their view, you don't need to be able to do otherwise in order to, for the decision to have been free. So he, he could have ordained that everybody had been conferred effectual grace and saved everyone. Mm -hmm. If he was truly loving, he would have done that. And there are some Calvinists who, who say that. They're, they're Calvinists and they're Universalists. I still disagree with them, but I find that more palatable at least. Mm -hmm. But the Calvinists who say, you know, God could have saved everyone, but chose not to. And yet he still loves everyone, even though Jesus didn't die for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, this is, uh, it just borders the incoherent. And it really violates my uh, deepest sensibilities about who God really is. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to overplay this, this, this argument, but you asked. And, and so, right. and this is my honest view. Um, I, and, I, and I think that in all honesty, Calvinist theology has, has driven vast numbers of people away from Christianity. And I can understand why that happens. And I think it's really, really tragic. Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, I trust that uh, none of those will, will be completely lost. I, I trust that God will draw them back and, and that they'll be open to that. Who knows? But um, theology is tremendously important. Mm -hmm. And uh, our conception of who God is is the most important thing of all. And uh, I think Calvinism is just not quite right. <laughs> I, I see the um, now the w what's interesting there is uh, the way that you're um, in, in, in that argument the way that you're essentially I think making a couple of uh, presuppositions about the God the God of ethics that exists is the God of Scripture and the God of Scripture is a God of love so we can infer these things about him I'm, I'm wondering about there might be some people that look at other data uh, p p perhaps a, 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 a skeptic who looks at, say, the created order and says, you know, it seems like there are creatures that are designed to cause pain, you know, like scorpions, for example. It seems like their intent is to cause pain. And it seems like humanity has committed numerous atrocities uh, 
uh, throughout history. And it seems like if they, if, if humanity is meant to be the reflection of the God that's in charge, um, and this world is meant to be a reflection of you know the Creator God, it seems like the God in charge might actually be an evil God. And so, rather being the foundation of you know goodness and and love, it sounds to me like he it looks you know based on this other set of data here. Uh, it might actually be that he's the foundation of all evil that exists and the aberrations that exist in the world are these fleeting moments where we are, you know, say, empathetic or something like that. <laughs> um, and that's, that's the real picture. There's sort of a, sort of a, a mirror universe to, to, to uh, what, what you're suggesting. Um, so the, uh, it's kind of a twofold question. First, an ontological question. Does it really make sense for there to be a foundation of evil in the way that you kind of talk about there being a foundation for good. Um, and then secondly, is sort of an epistemic question, how would we know um, that this God is discernibly good as opposed to evil, uh, perhaps with or without, you know, scriptural revelation of that? Yeah. Oh, these are good questions. Yeah, I'm inclined to think that uh, evil is, is parasitic on the good, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about it, we, we don't think of that, that goodness is somehow a distortion of the evil. We think, of, we think of what is sort of the intended order, and then we see that some things fall short of that, right? And I don't know, there's something I just, I think, deeply visceral and intuitive about our recognition of these, of these fundamental foundational truths, right? Mm -hmm. So in a loving, harmonious relationship, we have a sense of propriety, of congruity, uh, right? Like there's just something right about this, right? When I was a kid, remember when I had mm -hmm. that experience watching that <laughs> commercial? I just thought, oh, there, there's just something utterly right and good and beautiful about feeding that child. So that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never had that experience of seeing something uh, twisted and distorted and evil and thinking that's the way it ought to be, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the paradigm, right? I've never had that sense experientially. And I don't think any of us has. Mm -hmm. We all of us have this deep sense that the world actually just isn't what it ought to be, right? Mm -hmm. It falls short. You see that in a relationship, you know, when it goes south or something like that. And it's like, man, it, it was really good there. We communicated freely. We, we had, had the self-giving relationship. We were really connecting at deep levels. And then something went wrong. Pride crept in, meanness crept in, uh, lack of gratitude crept in, something, and it spoiled it, right? Or, or just think about an analogy like milk. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. you know what good milk is and you know when it goes bad, it's, are you going to say, well, you know, the, the good is a distortion of that bad, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it just, it's sort of a, a violation of, of mm -hmm. our kind of, uh, you know, way of thinking of things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of in that Augustinian tradition of thinking of evil as a privation, a perversion of the, of the good. And so to speak of uh, evil's ontological foundations in the same sense that we're inclined to think about the ontological foundations of, of goodness, I, I do think is, it, it is a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I don't know, I suppose in terms of the, the epistemic question along these lines, I mean, it's the same sort of matter of what may, makes most uh, and best intuitive sense uh, for us, right? There, there are some kind of pre-theoretical apprehensions and understandings that we have to have on which we build our, mm -hmm. our theories. And I think this is probably one of those axiomatic ones among them, that we just simply are able to apprehend and, and recognize the, the foundational nature of the good, that it is what is axiomatic and it's the proper foundation on which to build. Uh, and, and things that are evil, warped, twisted, distorted um, are a violation uh, mm -hmm. of that of that norm and uh, and so in the pursuit of, of truth you know not partial truth and mm -hmm. goodness you know not evil but you know genuine goodness that moves us and you know in the deepest ways possible uh, and beauty in a similar sort of way um, in our recognition of these foundational transcendentals right uh, we simply we simply recognize that there's something non-negotiable about non-negotiable about them uh, at a very at a very foundational sort of level, and uh, and 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 then the idea that God somehow functions as the locus of ultimate goodness, or as the ultimate exemplar or archetype of the good. This isn't this 
I, I, Tom Morris at one point calls it a, perhaps something of an Anselmian intuition, which mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not close to that. But I think in addition to that, there's just a, a whole uh, range of reasons to think that God really is the best, most robust explanation of ultimate goodness. You know, and this, this is what we try to lay out. And the one who does this the best, of course, I think, is Robert Adams. He's mm -hmm. really the man. So uh, the, the book Finite and Infinite Goods, if you haven't read that book, I would suggest that you do. Because I mean, he gives a very sophisticated, uh, philosophically rigorous, elaborate case for gravitating to this hypothesis. And he does so in such a way that you don't have to desiccate goodness, you don't have to domesticate it, you don't have to water it down. I mean, it satisfies our most robust intuitions about mm -hmm. what the ultimate good should be, very much in the Platonic tradition, but it becomes a person, not just this kind of uh, abstract entity that's uh, causally a, a feat, like you mentioned mm -hmm. before. Yeah, so God himself, I think, is the good. I think we have good reason to believe this. And, and, and if that's the case, then we can know that God is what the Anselmian theologians talk about omnibenevolent, mm -hmm. impeccable, as the theologians talk about, uh, and, and all the rest. And if God is essentially good and essentially loving, the great news is that he loves everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's as a function of, of who he is. And uh, this is, of course, what makes the good news of the gospel truly good news. And sometimes, you know, we as evangelists and apologists come across in such a way that it, the gospel doesn't even sound like good news anymore. You know? mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, there's this bad news of we're sinners and we need to be mm -hmm. forgiven and all. Absolutely. But then comes this gloriously good news that mm -hmm. God actually loves us sent Jesus to die for us while we were yet sinners, made provision for our salvation, yearns to have a relationship with us, yearns to confer forgiveness upon us and transform and change us into the people we were meant to be. Our sins don't have to forever define us. We can be liberated from them, delivered from them, forgiven for them, and we can have victory over them and ultimately experience the deepest joy and satisfaction that we were designed to have. It's gloriously good news. It really is gloriously good news. And so as a moral apologist, I, I like to argue for God's existence, but the moral argument's beautiful because I, I think it does two additional things. I think it really hints that it's not just general the, theism that's mm -hmm. the best explanation, but distinctively Christian uh, theism. And the moral argument doesn't just tell us that God exists, but it tell us, tells us a lot about who God is. And God's essential love is at the, is at the heart of that.